So good evening, everyone. I'm Janice Folk Dawson. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a settler, an injured worker, and the executive vice president of the Ontario Federation of Labour. On behalf of the Ontario Federation of Labour, I'm excited to welcome you to tonight's screening. I also want to take this opportunity to thank and acknowledge the important and impactful work of the OFL First Nations Métis Inuit Circle and express our appreciation for convening tonight's event. It is now my honor to introduce to you the OFL FNMI Circle Vice President and Chair, Krista Marco. Over to you, Krista. Thank you so much, Janice. Sego uh, Anibuzu, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to see so many people were able to come out today. Uh, just before I start, I just wanted to give a shout out to the uh, FNMI Circle uh, members who, uh, some who are on the call today and some who unfortunately were unable to uh, make it here. So for those of you that are on my FNMI Circle, if you could um, use your raise hand function so that uh, you come across the top at the very beginning uh, so everybody can see who's here. So I have Dean from Awekta, Shiana from SEIU, Sean from Layuna, Jonathan from IBEW, Sabrina from ETFO, Daniel from OSSTF, Don from QP, Bernadette from ONA, Sharon from CUPW, and Michelle from the Society. Thank you, everybody. Now I would like to introduce you to Indigenous filmmaker and activist Layla Stats, formerly Black. Layla Stats is a multidisciplinary artist specializing in digital media marketing and content creation. She has trained thousands on the power of video for storytelling. Layla is a successful entrepreneur stepping outside of the box and sharing her experience and knowledge with other aspiring entrepreneurs with a story to tell. Layla is a fourth generation survivor of residential schools in Canada and stands to inspire others like her who are on their own reclamation story. Her activism for water protection and water rights for First Nations communities has taken her on a journey across Turtle Island and her gift for teaching and connecting has left lasting impacts on young and old. Layla has produced her own short documentary and is currently working on her second, which are screening through educational systems globally. She offers screenings, workshops and discussion panels to continue to spread education about Indigenous perspectives. Welcome Layla, can you tell us about your film? Bego Skano. Leila Stats Young Yats Anawara Niwagit Daroden Ganyat Gehaga Niwago Wan Jordan Oswego Nidawageno. Hello, my name is Leila Stats. I'm Mohawk Turtle Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River. And this film, uh, it started as a, a healing piece for myself. And there were moments when I thought, you know, who's really going to want to hear this story of, you know, my story? Like, is it really going to matter? And I wanted to say it out loud though, because there was things that I was understanding and learning on my, my reclamation journey of, of taking back my culture, taking back my, my Mohawk identity and the pride in that, that I was realizing uh, as I was going through that process that I, I needed to say, I needed to, I needed to put it out there. And so the film started as just a personal piece for me. Uh, I was able to find, you know, a little bit of a grant. Uh, I did the whole thing myself. Uh, so the filming, the editing, the sound, the production, uh, just kind of self-taught myself. And now it's turned into, uh, it's turned into a, a magical piece that started some incredible discussions. I've been able to screen it uh, for organizations globally. Uh, for companies and schools and everyone from grade six to, you know, university levels and, and creating these discussions and conversations, which I think are absolutely imperative in this time that we're in right now. So I'm not going to talk too much about the film because the opening of the film for me is the most important three minutes. It could be the most important three minutes of your life. Uh, the first three minutes, uh, honestly, was uh, one of my mentors called it the uh, skeleton key for indigenous wisdom and knowledge for that reclamation, that red road journey. Uh, and this is the skeleton key that opens everything. So really pay attention. And I wanna get right into it because it is our, our traditional way of opening any gathering, whether it's 
you know, virtual or in person ceremony, a meeting, a celebration, we always begin in this way. So I'm going to start the film. I do ask a, just a quick housekeeping uh, that you turn your cameras off while we're streaming. It just lowers the bandwidth, gets everything streaming properly. So we'll turn all of our cameras off. Uh, we will be in the chat to monitor. So if something's not working or uh, something's not, it's not streaming properly, anything like that. I also do have the streaming link uh, for anybody that's having issues um, with Wi-Fi or you might be out in some remote place, we're not sure. So we'll get started here and then we'll come back after the session uh, with your questions for a very interactive discussion and there is no, no you know, wrong question. So I really want you to pay attention and then think about how you want to express after. So now I will begin. The words before all else. I was told by people in the filmmaking industry that I shouldn't start the documentary with the Thanksgiving address. It can take up to 20 minutes to thank all elements of creation. And it's all in Mohawk, so you can't understand any of it. Most people don't speak Mohawk. I was told you'll lose them. They won't watch it. And for me, that was exactly why we had to start this film with the Ahoda Garibadegua. I remember the first time I heard the Thanksgiving address, I had no idea what they were saying. I was at a conference sitting there, an elder walked to the front of the room and started speaking. And even though I couldn't understand it, I knew it was significant. I knew it was important. I felt it in my bones, in my blood. But when I looked around, I saw people on their phones, checking out, getting bored and impatient. And it became very clear to me that this is part of the problem in our society. We're in this microwave society where we want everything now. We want it so bad that we can't even take the time to acknowledge the gratitude and the thankfulness for the things that we have that keep us alive. So as you listen to the Ahoda Geriwadegwa, I really want you to, even though you don't understand what they're saying, I really want you to connect with the feeling of gratitude and giving that thanks for all of these things and listening with a good mind. <laughs> Nayangwa <laughs> Dietina Juanado, Nayo Tunduni, Taito, Nayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora. Dietina Juanado, Neono Quatsuma, Taito Gari, Nayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora. Dietina Juanado, Ne Asan Nigunda de Cohogua, Taito Gari, Nayo Tohage, Nanagua Nigora. Dietina Juanado, Ne Wahyaniunta, Taito Gari, Nayo Tohage. Nanagua Nigora. 
Sego Skanagoa Leila Black Young Yats Anuwari Niwagi Daroden Ganyakehaga Niwago Wandroden Oswego Nidawageno Hello, my name is Leila Black. I'm Mohawk Turtle Clan from Six Nations. Mohawk Turtle Clan. But I never really knew what that meant. My Riga'on and Kega'on are generational survivors of the residential school. It was only recently when we made this decision to reclaim our Haudenosaunee identity, our, our language, our culture, that we started to become aware of just how impacted we had been from this ongoing trauma of residential schools. And as we begin to understand what we didn't know, it also became apparent that some things we didn't need to learn. We didn't have to be taught these things because they were in our blood all along. And one of those lessons was our connection to the water. It's literally in our blood. And one of the first things that I learned along this journey was the importance of the Thanksgiving address, the Ahodan Gariwadegwa, the words before all else. No ceremony, no gathering, nothing of significance would begin without these words. Uniting our minds, all is one, to give thanks. And the waters are just one of the elements recognized in this address. Onegashon'a, the waters. We give thanks to the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms. Waterfalls, rain, mist, streams, rivers, and oceans. Water connects us. Without it, we die. With one mind, we give thanks to the spirit of the water. Now, our minds are one. As I share my papa's story with you, I want you to think about your own connection to water. Feel it flow within you. Feel it pulse in your veins, in your blood. So let's go back to where my relationship with water first started. Gord Stotts, the son of Ernest and Susan Stotts, the grandson of Christine Stotts. My middle name is Christine, after her. Christine was a student at the Mohawk Institute Residential School. I never knew her, but I feel like I still carry her with me. And one of the things I definitely feel is the trauma. I remember stories of her being passed down, of her escaping from the windows and scaling the walls just to get away instead of passing down a gift of culture and language and this beautiful tradition to her children and her grandchildren, like the Creator intended, she passed down a coat of shame. She literally had the Indian beat out of her, and that trauma trickled down through our family. The love that one gets from a parent, Christine never had, never learned how to experience how to share it. Imagine that as a child, never feeling love, never experiencing love. And that pattern continues through generations. 
My puppet's childhood was cold and hard. Because of that residential school, he didn't know his language. He didn't know his culture. He didn't know anything that I'm about to share with you here in this video. And I always saw him as kind of afraid of it. He would tell us not to use our last name on our resume because we wouldn't get the job. He would tell us not to tell people that we were native, not to go to the reserve because it was dangerous. He cast that code of shame down to us, his grandchildren. We were Mohawk Turtle Clan, but that was all we knew. And we didn't even know what that meant. And like a lot of families, dealing with this intergenerational trauma, alcoholism, violence, depression, trauma, sprinkled throughout my family, it spread like a, a virus you couldn't get rid of. And only when my brother and sister and I started to learn our Haudenosaunee culture, did we start to recognize this dark spot that had been living inside of us. And as I started to learn about the history of my family, the history of what happened to hundreds of thousands of these Indigenous children, what happened to Christine, I started to understand those feelings of not belonging. I started to understand that pain and anger I was carrying around. And I really started to get it. And thus started my healing journey. My papa may have never taught me the Ahodan Garibadegua. He didn't show me the ceremonies. He didn't show me the history of the Ganyakehaga. But one thing he did teach me was the relationship and responsibility that I had to water. As I look back now, I see residential schools, they may have cut their hair off. They may have taken their names and give them numbers, taken their language. But even through that coat of shame, my papa felt the water. It was alive to him. It was alive inside of him. And he passed that on to me. Nyawagoa, Gord. Every morning he'd wake up at dawn and he would walk this land. He dug these ponds on this land so that future generations of his family would always have access to water. He spoke at conferences in our nation's capital about how these ponds could help indigenous communities that didn't have access to water. He dug ponds for other people in the community. Water is in our blood and I come to these spots to see through all of that trauma that was passed down to me and heal with the water. We all have different connections with the water. Different, yet the same. To me, the water is almost like a physical manifestation of spirit. You can see spirit flowing down beside you. For me, whenever I'm feeling, you know, down or lost, or I just have a question, I just go and I sit by the water and I just listen and it all comes and it all just feels right. I grew up on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and when I left I remember dreaming about it and I still dream about it decades later because the water that I grew up around was also in my blood. Water is what makes up most of your body so it's outside of you and it's alive and well just like your body is, so you can literally see the spirit in the water as it's flowing. The Grand River has been an integral part of the Haudenosaunee life. The city of Brantford and surrounding areas is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Attawatam people. And the work we do, the activism, the learning, it will never be complete unless we acknowledge and remind ourselves and others that colonization is not just a thing of the past. We must acknowledge settlers have access to this land because of colonial violence. The Haldeman Treaty guaranteed the exclusive use of 950,000 acres, six miles along each side of the Grand River to the Haudenosaunee people, to the members of Six Nations, to this day, through the process of colonialism, racism, genocide, settlers have secured 902,000 acres, leaving 48,000 acres for Six Nations. So we have to acknowledge the resilience of these Six Nations communities that have lived, loved, and resisted here forever. 
We acknowledge the resilience of this land. We acknowledge our role in decolonizing the mindset of the land we all call home now. And after all these broken treaties and stolen lands, still more than 50% of homes on Six Nations are running without running water. But who has the rights to these waters? The Haudenosaunee speak in terms of responsibility, respect to the water, not in terms of water rights. The law of the land is not of police and government, but it's a higher law. The original instructions, Ahodan Gariwadegwa. The creator gave us this task as humans to recite the Thanksgiving address, which is a constant reminder of the early law of the land, to first give thanks. We believe that at one time all creatures, all living things could communicate, talk to each other, even the water. Today, the water's lost its ability, lost its voice, and it's the responsibility of the Haudenosaunee to uphold the voice of the water. It was passed down to us. So being the voice of the water, much different than owning it or having a right to it. What happens if we don't have enough water? What happens if we poison our water? What does our world look like? My papa may have never learned the traditional beliefs of his ancestors. He never learned the Thanksgiving address. He never went to Longhouse and he never spoke a single Mohawk word. He didn't really have you know, a connection to his culture, but without knowing it, you know, he was he was like one of the most indigenous men that I knew. The knowledge that he carried, how to create these ponds, how to create clean ecosystems and habitats for all our creatures out here, how to really, really, you know, cultivate the water and make it safe to drink. It's just so amazing to kind of watch him and do these super indigenous things without really knowing who he was. He may have been ashamed and afraid of who he was because of colonization, but it's not too late for us. It was those walks along the water's edge where I first remember truly feeling connected, connected to the bigger picture, connected to nature, connected to life and to Mother Earth. I remember understanding at a very early age, I had to take care of the water. And now I'm understanding that it's my responsibility to be the voice of the water which is why I wanted to make this film. I wanted to share his story and other stories. I get to sing with the water, to the water, for the water. Water is life. It holds energy and it's alive. One of the other lessons I learned as I started to reclaim my culture was the Turo wampum. My name is Susie Miller. I am a teacher at Emily C. General Elementary School at Six Nations. Our ancestors knew how to live in relationship because they lived in relationship for thousands of years. So the Turo is the first treaty that was made outside of Indigenous nations from Turtle Island. One purple row represents the, the ship of those that came across the water. The other row represents the canoe the canoe of our ancestors, traveling the waters. What those two, row, two rows do is they travel parallel down the river of life, side by side, without interfering. In this row, in the ship, thinking and way of life tends to be linear. It's always progressing. In the canoe way of understanding, it's like a circle, it's a cycle, and everything is connected. This treaty, when it was made, um, it's, it's a promise, and there was no end point because they said that as long as the grasses grow and the rivers flow, um, this treaty will be in existence and it still exists today, how we are to be living in relationship with each other. Residential schools may have taken our languages. They may have taken our culture and our access to knowledge and ancestral wisdom. They may have caused trauma and pain that is still being felt today. But through all that, they could not take away my papa's connection to the water. It was inside of him all along, just like it's inside of you. 
Thank you for spending this time with me and my papa and the water and my family. Water is life. Yongana longwa onega. Onegawahi. Gunalongwa. This is for my bloodline, all my natives on the front line. Keep your money in your pipeline, cause nobody in their right mind. This is for my sisters, they were stolen and they're missing. And this is for my grandmother, and this is for your grandmother. Hit them with the water song up, G, yo. Shout to come a day like an alarm. So wake up out of juke, show and take up arms. Cause more is necessary, the vocabulary woe. It's a toxic rock and pull. Hitting your front door, CIA, I see you later. Your time is coming soon. I flip that shit like Machina on a duck day afternoon. Yo, Attica, Attica, drug hit, just make it static. Cause Logan stats is back with Layla Black, like, uh. So I need a little water, so hit him with the water song, up G, yo. Let me hit my water bomb, up G, yo. Hit me with the water song, up G, yo. It's usually a dance party. It's a good time. Thank you so much, Nyoma Goa. That's how we th say thank you. Well, Nyoma means thank you, and Goa means big. So Nyoma Goa means big thank you. Uh, thank you so much for taking that time just to watch. I saw that someone just came in the waiting room. I'm like, oh no, you just missed the whole thing. <laughs> uh, but I will definitely, uh, we are recording this and I did tell Janice that we could share uh, the streaming recording replay with uh, with your private audience. So uh, I'm, I'm glad. So if you did just jump on, don't worry. We'll make sure that you get to watch the film. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, yeah, so that film, like I said, it was completely self-produced. Uh, I just had an idea. I just, I had a story inside of me. And I think that that's really what sparked it is, you know, I, I realized that something was missing inside of me. Something, something was, was broken that I was fixing. And it was that identity of who I was as a Mohawk woman and uh, coming to an understanding of that. So uh, one of the, actually the, one of the workshops I'm working on are, are just about to launch uh, next month up in Thunder Bay for uh, a group of youth is uh, healing through our stories in a digital world. Uh, because I feel like, you know, just telling the story, just saying some of those things out loud that had been trauma, you know, trauma passed down through my family. Uh, you know, I remember and there was a survivor. So I do a lot of work at Woodland Cultural Center and I work with the survivors very closely. And uh, one of the sur survivors, Geronimo Henry, I don't know if anyone's ever met him, but if you haven't uh, put his name into Google, he's got some amazing interviews on YouTube. Uh, and he's a very dear friend of mine. And he, uh, he went to the school for 11 years. So he got there when he was five and he left when he was 16. And he said to me, Layla, in those 11 years, Never once did I hear the words, I love you. And I just sat with that. It really hit me uh, really hard because as a child, I remember thinking, why doesn't my mom tell me that she loves me? You know, why can't, why don't we say that to each other? Like I see other parents, um, you know, why is my family struggle so much to show that love and internalizing that as a child, you don't understand 
Uh, you know, I grew up in town, so I saw people with very different parenting uh, than mine, and I didn't understand why it was different. So that one story Geronimo shared with me was like a, it was like a wait, just like a whoosh, like, wait a second. Like it just like it, it became clear. It was like this hurt inside of me. I suddenly understood it. And I said, you know, it's, he never, he never was taught how to say, I love you. He was never taught how to show that love and, and compassion and caring and kindness. Uh, and then, you know, he had to be a parent and Geronimo talks about, you know, growing up as a parent and, you know, uh, he felt like he had PTSD from prison. He didn't know how to operate in society and he didn't know how to parent. Um, so then you think about those those generational links that happen. And I think that that's one of the really important things for us to remember as we talk about truth and reconciliation um, is that residential schools, it, although we're looking at it as something that happened in the past, something happened a long time ago, get over it. You know, I've, I've heard that, like it happened so long ago. How can you still be talking about it? Uh, but those generational impacts, that, that intergenerational trauma that passes on like through our DNA, uh, you're, I'm growing up thinking that something's wrong with me because my mom doesn't tell me she loves me as much as, you know, other, other kids at school. And, uh, I realized, you know, it, this is, this is generational trauma. This is exactly what it is. And, um, so that story, one story helped me to heal. Then I started to do work. And as they were, as uh, it was discussed earlier, I'm working on a new documentary right now. Um, where I went to various First Nations communities across Turtle Island and in, in uh, Hopi and California, up in Northern Ontario, uh, out in BC, and, and really shone a light on their water insecurities, why these communities are dealing with boil water advisories, why they don't have access to clean water, uh, why their water sources are being threatened. So I was filming this documentary about water and meeting people in all of these various you know, communities. And I started to see these, these parallels, these similarities that we have in the States, they call them boarding schools, uh, but they're the same thing. And uh, I was talking to a young man who was there, he was maybe 24 years old. And uh, I was telling him that story that I just told you uh, about Geronimo. And I saw the same thing happen when I told him about what Geronimo had said about, have you never heard the words, I love you? He, uh, it, just, it also, it looked like I could see it on his face. You know, I could see this, like, like he was figuring something out, like he was getting it. And uh, he said, you know, my grandfather only ever told me he loved me once. And he was drinking and he was on his deathbed and he was dying. And he finally told me, you know, grandson, I love you. Thank you for taking care of me in these moments. And he's like, only just now when you said that, he's like, did I really understand that he just didn't know how? It wasn't that he didn't love me. He just didn't know how to communicate that and express that. So this one story, and, and I talk a lot about stories because I, uh, our, our indigenous wisdom is based on oral, an oral history. This is how we learn. This is how we teach is by talking, by sharing our experiences. And it's probably, you know, one of the disconnects that you're feeling in your life uh, in this, you know, fast paced modern society, high touch, where we don't just slow it down and have a conversation and talk about our day. Uh, one of the things that I'm really adamant about in my house is the story of the day. And so my kids know that when they sit down with me at dinner, they're gonna, we're going to talk about our stories of the day. And they usually pick something really awesome because they are, they're like, yeah, that, you know, my story of the day. But it's this practice of looking people in the eye, looking the people that you love in the eye and, and communicating these stories. So the story came from, you know, a point of Geronimo telling me that it was healing for him to tell me that story it was healing for me to hear it, to receive it to understand it. And then when I went on to communicate that and to share it with other people, uh, it started to heal others. And so that's this power of our, our stories. And that's why this film, you know, it's a small 20 minute documentary, kind of giving you an overview of what my family has been through in this process of going back to who, who I am. Um, but 
you know, it's a, it's an opportunity for healing, not only for me, but now I've, as I've screened it, um, for many indigenous and non-indigenous, uh, I've realized that this is not just my story. And, um, you know, we look at the impacts of residential schools. We look at 150 years of this oppression and uh, this colonial violence. And then you, you think about, you know, it's, we start to understand it. And I, I think that that's, that's one of the big things that I, I try to communicate is, you know, once and we're all learning here, many of us, I, I, you know, I've had people uh, come through that were just really learning or realizing that residential schools ever even happened. Uh, as these discoveries are happening in Kamloops, uh, you know, people were, were like, wow, I didn't, I didn't even know that. So they're at the very beginning stages of their learning. But in my mind, I feel like once we learn something, we can't unlearn it. Once we know something, we can't unknow it. So as you start to learn more, hear more stories, watch more films, go to more discussions and panels and hear people communicate their perspectives and what they've been through, you can't, you can't erase that from your knowing. And it changes how you operate. It changes uh, you know, how you see things, how you see your neighbors, how you see your fellow, uh, you know, you see those, those people in the front line that are out there you know, marching or you, know, you start to understand, you're like, okay, I, I get it. You see uh, some of the issues that indigenous people are facing like over incarceration rates and uh, suicide, alcoholism, addiction, <laughs> depression. Uh, so many of these, these, uh, these, anal, these they're, they're really almost like a, a disease that's stemming from these linear connections to generational trauma. So um, I would love to open it up for conversation. If you want to turn your cameras back on, don't be afraid. I'm a real person. Uh, I do these for kindergarten classes too. So <laughs> if you guys want to want to get in on the kindergarten activities, we do some icebreakers. I'll be all about that. Uh, but yeah, I just, you know, kind of your feedback, any of your thoughts, because it's really, uh, it does a lot for me, uh, you know, especially in this virtual world where sometimes we can feel like, you know, I'm sitting here in this room alone with a camera, a green dot looking at me. Uh, but really there's people out there, you know, there's people out there. So uh, the more we can exchange and, you know, share your, your, uh, your feelings, you know, how did you feel? What did you learn? What questions sparked up from within you that you want answered? And there's no wrong questions. I will never be offended by, you know, the way that you said it something or anything like that. This is a safe place. And I like to create that. So I think we have a question. Uh, well, we have a hand up. I, I like this already. Kindergarten classes, they know how to use their hands. You guys do too. <laughs> yeah. So we actually, we have a few questions that we want to ask you first um, about uh, your film. Yeah. Okay. And then we'll go to, uh, if we have enough time, hopefully <laughs> we can get to people who have questions outside of, of these questions. So I, I promise I will not stump you. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, in your film, you talk about reclaiming your Mohawk culture and knowing that so many indigenous people have had everything stripped from them, you know, their language, their names, and even had their hair cut off, you know, um, and that they all have this uh, feeling of shame um, that was basically imposed upon them um, and, and future generations, because we, we talk about that intergenerational trauma and the need to hide their indigenous roots, right? So how do you go about finding the truth? Where, where do you go to start and and what is the process um and where did you get your resources like just to even start in your journey to reclaim your culture mm -hmm. well, one of the first places that i went was to the community so i went back to six nations and i started to plug in uh when there was when that was actually the first place that i heard that thanksgiving address is because i was like okay i'm gonna i see there's there's this event out there i'm gonna go you know, I don't care if, you know, I don't feel like I belong or I don't feel native enough to go to the res because I don't know any of these things about myself. And I have this shame of, you know, that was, has been passed down to me. Uh, but I just kind of made this decision. I was like, no, I'm going to go. There's an event happening. It was like a women's day 
uh, Haudenosaunee women celebrating each other. I was like, I'm going to go. And then I heard the Thanksgiving address and I was like, that's really, there's something significant here. Like it, it vibrated within me. There was like this ancestral knowledge. Like I knew that this prayer or whatever this, this elder was saying, I had to pay attention. I knew it was important. I knew, even though I had no idea what it was or why it was or what he was saying, I was like, this is, this is significant. I need to start here. And so uh, one of the books that I suggest anyone reading uh, is by Tom Porter and it's called Grandma Says. And uh, he, it's actually, uh, he carried a voice recorder around for like six months and he just recorded his, all of his stories, everything, all of the knowledge that had been passed down to him from his grandmother. Uh, and it's put into this book. And the book, because it was him like verbally speaking, it's like he's talking to you. Like he's, he's when you're reading it, it's like he's speaking to you and he's, he shares all of the wisdom about the, the ceremonies in our, our Thanksgiving address. He talks about weddings. He talks like all of these things. I was like, wow, this is like the, the, the grandma Bible right here that, you know, gives us all of the knowledge that, uh, you know, we wish that we had that because as this next generation, you know, a lot of the elders are, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're on their way. Uh, they're on the way to their next path. And, you know, with that sacred knowledge that's within them, I always say if my grandma had a, had had a blog or a vlog, um, you know, like, I'd be like, oh my gosh, that is the most sacred website on the internet. Uh, but she, you know, it didn't exist back in those days. So, so yeah, I would definitely suggest that book. Uh, one of the things that you also can do is, you know, finding, finding uh, people that are on that path, that are walking that path as well, because I know firsthand how scary it can be. Uh, I remember the first time I went into a longhouse and, uh, you know, I was just so nervous that I was going to do something wrong, that I was going to say something wrong. What if I sit in the wrong place? What if I, you know, like just to be silent, don't say anything. Don't, you know, I was just really, really nervous. And I know that feeling, uh, and it actually stops a lot of people from ever going, um, because they have that fear because there is this feeling of, you know, they're, uh, there are more indigenous people living off reserve that are disconnected from their culture than there are on reserve that are completely, uh, you know, tapped in and traditional. And, and that was designed intentionally. Uh, but it also means that there are a lot more of me, <laughs> you know, the, those that are, that have this feeling inside of us that, you know, when I look at the water, when I look at a sunset, when I hear birds, I feel something deeper. And I always knew that, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know. I was, I had no idea this, this indigenous knowledge and wisdom and ancestral knowledge that was in, in my DNA uh, and just started activating it. So one of the pieces of advice I would give to you is, you know, find someone that's taking that journey, ask them for advice. That's the one thing that, you know, I've had a lot of people reach out to me and ask me, you know, Hey, you know, I, I want to, I want to learn my language too. You know, I want to go back and I want to go to a ceremony. I want to, I want to know who my ancestors were. Uh, and sometimes it's just having someone to talk about it with uh, can be enough to give you the courage to go seek it out. Um, on Six Nations, we have some really amazing resources. Uh, the Genealogy Society was really, really helpful for me. Um, they have this crazy um, family tree that I could track back and like all the way to like Joseph Grant. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is, this is really amazing. So yeah, uh, definitely finding that, hearing the voice, hearing that calling that's calling you back and then just you know, facing that fear of why you shouldn't or what might happen or all those bad things and just doing it anyways. And like listening to your gut, listening to your instincts. I think that that's one, one of the things that I have, I have fine tuned and it almost feels like a superpower now because I've been listening to my instincts so much. I've been like, okay, what, what, what does my heart tell me? And I never stopped to think about that before. You know, we just go, 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 go so fast doing all the things. Uh, and just saying, wait a second, what does, what is my heart saying right now? Let me have a conversation here for a second and sit with, you know, my true self. And, uh, you know, these are the things that seem trivial, but 
they really are the underlying foundation of our connectedness to everything. So, so yeah, I hope that answers your question in some roundabout way. <laughs> no, that was wonderful. And it gave a lot of information to everybody. Uh, so next we have a question from our OFL FNMI circle member, Jonathan Lemoyne. So go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, Layla. Thanks for uh, doing this. And uh, my question sort of is related to the last one. Um, somebody that is also on a journey to discovering my indigenous roots. Um, I guess my question is, uh, for people that are starting a journey and have young children, how would you maybe suggest including your children in this journey? Um, you know, like, I don't want to see my daughter uh, end up like me with little to no knowledge because I wasn't taught or my parents just simply didn't know. Yeah. Definitely, and I, I, it's really important for me because I, I do have three little kids, um, seven, six, and, and four, and uh, they know that I, you know, they know that I do a lot of work at the Mohawk Institute. They know that I go there a lot, and they, you know, they'll drop me off sometimes with their dad, and they'll, they'll come on the grounds, and they love going to the, to the grounds. Um, but one of the things that I found, people ask me all the time, you know, how do you, how do you actually talk to your kids? because I do so much work with Orange Shirt Day and uh, I did this Orange Road Home. We did an orange run. It was a 20 kilometer running phrase, like $30,000 uh, for the Save the Evidence campaign. But they, so they see all this orange and, you know, I really wanted them to understand it, but also not load them with negative, scary stories that make them sad um, about their ancestors. You know, I really wanted to empower them to be proud of their ancestors and not feel sorry for our ancestors. And I think that that was an important thing for me to make sure that, you know, it's not just all this bad stuff happened to us, but let's look at the beauty. Let's look at the under, let, let's look at who we were before this bad stuff happened. Um, and let's pull out what we can from there. So that Thanksgiving address is something that um, we, I have it on a video uh, because I can't recite it yet. It's a, it's a work in progress. I'm reclaiming my Mohawk language, but it's like reprogramming your brain and seeing words backwards in all different sort of ways. And it's really, really challenging. Uh, but so that video, Daya Hyundai, who recorded that video for me, um, he's, he said, use it. He's like, as, as much as you can. He's like, as many people as you can show it to as possible, anytime you can. And so uh, he said to me, he's like, put it on YouTube. He's like, I want it to be on YouTube so anybody can watch it anytime. And so I put it on YouTube. Uh, I'm like, well, when the elder tells you to do it, you do it. <laughs> so I put it on there and uh, so my kids will watch it all the time. And uh, that really that gratitude, even though it's just those little things like, um, there's a really great book is called the Coyotes Guide. And it's got 13 different rules of, you know, nature connections. And so there's a different, there's different activities that I do with my kids. One of them is animal forms. And I do this when I do kindergarten workshops. Um, so even just getting down on the ground and acting out animals, connecting to that jaguar spirit, you know, connecting to your, your inner eagle uh, and letting kids feel that connection. Uh, another thing that I do is, uh, really focus on the relationships that we have. So the Thanksgiving address, it's not just about giving thanks. I'm not just thankful for the trees. I'm not just thankful for the water, but I'm really acknowledging my reciprocating relationship with the water, with the trees. What do I do for them? What do they do for me? We are coexisting here. I am grateful and honoring that relationship. Um, so it's not just saying thanks for being here. Thanks for the air you gave me. Um, but it's really, you know, how, how do we work together? So uh, when kids, with kids, I try and put that into, into real, you know, real world things they can see. Like, uh, I'll ask you the same question I ask the kindergartens. When you think of plants, what's the first color comes into your mind? And if anybody said green, that's what all the kindergartens say too. So green is actually a magical color. And every time you see green out there in nature, I want you to remember that it's magic because what's happening on a scientific level is that inside all of the green, 
there's these tiny little, little cells called chlorophyll. And those chlorophyll cells are actually turning what we're breathing out into air back to us that we can breathe. So every time you see green out in nature, I want you to think about that relationship that you have to breathing with that leaf, breathing with that tree, breathing with that plant. Uh, and now, you know, like we, I think we put like 400 kindergartens through that workshop and I was like, yeah, they're all just going to see green differently. Um, you know, and so it's just little things like that, that can change a child's connection. It's not, it doesn't always have to be, um, you know, this is the protocol. This is the way, uh, you know, you must go to this ceremony. You must do that. Like it, a lot of it is just that our, our innate connection to the world around us that we're, we haven't been taught, that we haven't been exposed to. So uh, giving our kids that chance, they'll develop it naturally. Um, and when you create those spaces, they, they truly thrive. They really love it. So yeah, that's usually what I do. <laughs> Act like, uh, <laughs> like rabbits or cows or monkeys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it's our interesting that kids as, um, you know, as a parent, thinking about generational trauma, it's been really important for me to break that cycle, it's really important for me to, you know, show my children love. Uh, I remember thinking when I was a little kid, you know, I wish my mom would just, you know, sing songs and tuck me in and, and stroke my hair till I fell asleep. But she's not that kind of mom, you know, like, and I don't begrudge my mom. Everyone's always like, does your mom know you say this stuff? And I'm like, yeah, she knows because she knows what, what it was like. And she will be the first to tell you there was no hugs and kisses and loves and cuddles. Um, but understanding why that was there. So then I, you know, now I make it a you know, priority in my life that like I'll stroke their hair till they fall asleep. And there's just something in me that's like, oh, you know, like you see your daughter fall asleep to you stroking her hair, singing her song. And it's, it's like, okay, we're, we're making a positive change. We are doing the healing work. We are making the changes that we need to do to make sure that these traumas are not passed on to our children. All right. So I think um, we're going to squeeze in one more question just because I want to squeeze in one more question. <laughs> so our next question is actually coming from another OFL Circle member. Uh, Cheyenne Medicine. So Cheyenne, go ahead. Oh, I really enjoyed your documentary. Um, so the film has a focus on water and everyone's connection to it. Um, what actions can people take now to advocate and protect the water? Well, I would say one of the first things that you can do is change how you see your relationship to water. So um, for many of us, water is not even a thought. You know, we turn the tap on, we grab a bottle. Uh, you know, it's, it's not even, we don't even process our relationship to it as we're drinking it because we've been so desensitized to its availability. Um, you know, when you have to go walk 10 kilometers to a river source and fill up a pail and bring it back to your village and boil it and make sure that it's safe for them. That's a completely different relationship that you have to that water that you drink. Um, so understanding that water is alive. I think that was one of the things that really changed how I saw water was it's an, a living thing. It's not just a chemical composition of, you know, hydrogen and oxygen, but it has in, in between the spaces of those those atoms you know there's this energy force there's this life force uh, and it is we are truly all dependent on it so for me the, what can you do to save the water well there's lots of things I've done and I'm not saying that you put yourself you know in front of 100 RCMP or you get yourself thrown in jail um, but sometimes those those actions are necessary um, to take a stand to uh, say you know, that we are here in protecting the water and we will not stand down. Uh, I think that that was a really important thing for me to do, but uh, there are, you know, if, if you're out there and you're wondering what can I do to protect the water, there's, there's ways that you can support those that are on the front line. There are ways that you can support, uh, you know, the, the OFL is always supporting our land defenders and, you know, right there, marching beside us uh, on many other front lines, but, you know, doing things like 
donating uh, clothing, warm clothes. I, you know, I was out there in minus 30 and these people are camping in minus 30. <laughs> like it's, it, it's totally crazy. Uh, travel funds, legal funds. Uh, you know, we just had 30 land defenders uh, that were on co in court on Valentine's Day and those legal fees are not cheap. So, uh, you know, there are ways that you can, if you can't get your boots on the ground, you use your, your voice, your audience, you're here right now. Uh, you know, that is something. The fact that you are taking the action to expand your understanding of what, what people, real people are facing when it comes to water issues, um, you know, that matters. So even if it's like you, you share something that you learned here tonight, something you learned, because you learned something, whether it's you know, about the treaties, whether it's about the two row, whether it's about residential schools, whether it's about generational trauma, you've learned something that you didn't know before. So you take that knowledge and you operate with that knowledge out in the world. You share that knowledge, you share that perspective that you've, you've grown, you, you have a new understanding and we are not quiet about it. So that's the one thing that you, as you're learning these things, if, you, if you're angry about something, if you're, you know, if you feel like something's not right, don't be quiet about it. Speak out, use your voice uh, because your voice matters. And we all have these different uh, backgrounds and gifts that come together. And when we, we all use our voice to amplify this message, because, you know, I, I it's kind of crazy. I think about uh, who remembers in, in COVID when we ran out of toilet paper? You remember how crazy people got when there was no toilet paper? Now, I just want you to think about your life. I think about what would happen if that was water. The panic. The, it, it, you can't even fathom it, right? So, and, and that's, not, that's not a so far future from where we are at right now. If we look at, if we truly look at our, our river, the Grand River, I mean, you know, we wouldn't even let our kids swim in there, <laughs> you know? And then... So that's, it's something to be aware of that that's a real potential threat and it's a threat for all of us. You know, it's, a, it, it's something that it's not just going to affect you or me, but it's going to also affect all of that magical green that's out there in the world. It's going to affect all of those monkeys and animals that we were pretending to be all of us will be affected. So, you know, I think that that's something that we can take to heart and operate from, from that place from here on out. No, thank you. So we're out of time. <laughs> as much as we love, we love talking and, and going back and forth. We are out of time, unfortunately, very sorry. <laughs> So I just want to thank everybody and especially thank Layla for coming and showing us her film. Um, just so people know, we did record this session. We will make it available so people can relook at it, especially if you want to rewatch the film over and over and over again, which I know everybody's going to do because we all want to learn the Mohawk address just because, you know, that Thanksgiving address, I will learn it one of these days. Um, <laughs> and I know I'm not the only one who is looking forward to that. So thank you so much, everybody. You know, Goa. Uh, Miigwech, and I hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful evening. And again, Layla, you are amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Yola, thank you so much. Thanks, Janice. Thank you, everybody. You're awesome. Appreciate all of you. <laughs>